Good evening. Welcome to number six of Principles of Grammar. Our subject tonight is punctuation. Punctuation. With the most emphasis on the trickiest punctuation mark and one of the most crucial, the comma. But I want to start with the topic of punctuation as such. Many people have a cavalier attitude toward punctuation. They may grant that the principles of grammar are objective and important, and not merely social, but when they come to punctuation, they think it's only a matter of convention, the arbitrary decree of society or linguistic authorities, some kind of matter of caprice. And they view punctuation as an issue of sticking in a mark every now and then whenever the spirit seizes them. Now, this is not correct or valid. <coughs> punctuation is a branch of grammar. It's defined by objective principles. It's not social, it's not conventional, it's not subjective or arbitrary. It is an essential adjunct of clear thought and writing with definite rules governing it, and there are good reasons for these definite rules. Now, of course, there's an optional element in punctuation, as we've seen there is in every aspect of grammar, but that's irrelevant to this point, because the basic principles of punctuation are mandatory, and that's what we're going to focus on. Now, the best way to see right off the, at the outset the role of punctuation is to consider what life and writing would be without it. Uh, if you've ever seen a book reproducing early Greek, you would right away know why punctuation is necessary. Because you would see simply a massive block of letters without breaks from one side to the other, line after line after line. They had no punctuation in the early Greek, and they had, in fact, no idea of putting spaces between words. It was just a sprawl of letters. They kept going till they got to the end of the line and started the next and filled it without stopping till they got to the next, etc. And, of course, your mind simply closes to look at this mass with no indication of what's where. And this is true even if you knew the alphabet. Now, you see, it seemed obvious to them at the time there was no precedent, and so it seemed obvious that when you put words on paper, as soon as you finish one, you start the next. Till you run out at the end of the, ne of the line, and then you do the same thing on the next line. So an actual achievement was required to reach what we consider obvious, namely putting nothing between uh, successive words, just like the discovery of zero uh, in mathematics was an important discovery. But of course, Simply spaces between words was not enough because soon you had a sea of separate words, but they still ended up an impenetrable block without any guide to untangle. So they started putting in points every once in a while, little dots or marks to break up the mass. And that is all punctuation etymologically means, putting in punks, putting in points. Or if you want a more formal definition, which is really the same, putting in marks to make the meaning clear. Putting in little marks at various stages of a sentence to make the meaning clear. That's all of me. Little dots are rigid. Now at first, this invention was rare, but it caught on, it was widespread by the Middle Ages, <coughs> although it was chaotic then. People had all kinds of points, now, one man's points were completely different from the next man's points, and so on. It wasn't standardized. Gradually, with the discovery of printing, it became standardized, and it's really only very recently, actually within the last hundred years, that we have developed a firm, rational system of stable punctuation, which is a great blessing. Now, that's some more or less the history of punctuation, but let's look at it purely philosophically. What is the purpose of punctuation? What about the human mind requires it? What element of the human method of thinking, the human cycle of epistemology? Now, who can guess? And if you guess wrong, I'm going to ignore your answer. Yeah. So if you could group things, 
things and to associate it or like to group things, you say, but why do we have to group things? Why can't we just go word after word endlessly and take it all in? Why do we need points or stops? In order, because you can't, you can't form a hierarchy from um, just millions of concrete. Well, why do we need a hierarchy? Why can't we just go on and take it in? Yes. Well, the chrome epistemology. The chrome epistemology. You can only hold so many units in your mind at a time. And beyond that, snap, you lose the content. You remember, we've discussed this, that the, the crow is an example. It can count one, two, three in effect, but that's all it can take in. Uh, and uh, this stands for the basic principle that the mind is finite, limited. What you can hold in the focus of consciousness is severely limited. This is the whole base, remember, of the conceptual form of cognition. We can perceive this table, this table, this table, this table. But the endless number of tables that actually exist, we could never hold in our mind, except by grouping them all together under one term, one concept, table, which makes that whole totality a single unit. And that's, of course, the role of concepts. We've seen this same principle, the curl epistemology at work in regard to subordination, if you remember. Now, the same issue applies when reading or uttering a sentence. There are only so many units you can hold. And here the units are individual words, but it's the same issue. Consequently, you have to condense, you have to economize the units, you have to reduce the number being held in the focus of awareness. And you have to do so continuously. That's how the mind actually functions. You hear five to ten words, say. Your mind actually can't hold any more until you somehow condense the first set into a single unit. Then you go on to form, say, the next five or ten into a unit. You combine it with the preceding into one bigger unit, and so on. Let me give you a schematic example. Suppose <laughs> I utter a whole stream of words to you like this without a break. Now, this is schematic, but I'll give you the idea. He walked into the heavily furnished room wearing a loud tie with stripes, but when it started to rain heavily with large splashy drops, he went to the closet and put on his father-in-law's huge white fedora. I suppose I continue just loading that on you without stops of any kind. At a certain point, your mind stops. Now suppose at a judicious point, I put in a point, like a punctuation mark. Suppose I say, he walked into the heavily furnished room wearing a loud red tie with stripes, comma or dash, or something, to indicate that's one development. And then I say, but when it started to rain heavily with large splashy drops, he went to the, uh, with drops, and then I put another point in, a comma or whichever, then he went to the closet, etc. Then your mind, in effect, at each stopping point, instantaneously sums up the first into a single uh, unit. For instance, it would stand in your mind at entry, rain, Fedora, or whatever the particular word you use to capture the essence of it. You take a whole group, the punctuation mark tells you to stop, add up into a unit. Then you add up the next, and you combine with the preceding. You're constantly condensing words into a unit, then the next group, etc. And this is the basic purpose of punctuation. Mm -hmm. It guides to the crawl within you, so to speak, telling you when to add up words into a unit. So it really are guides as to how to condense in your own mind so that you can take it in. Now let's expand a bit on what such condensation really consists of. It amounts to two processes which we perform all the time. Breaking up and putting together. Or if you want a more jazzy name for it, what would you call it? Analysis. analysis and synthesis. Analysis means breaking up a whole into parts. Synthesis means putting the parts together into a whole. Separating and uniting, whatever you want to call it. And if you know the objectivist epistemology, you know that this is the essence of all cognition. When we form a concept, for instance, we have to separate tables, if that's our example, from everything else, and then put them together into a whole. When you look at a face, trying on to look at somebody's face, you 
you want to grasp the whole, how do you do it? Well, you first you have to roll from part to part and see each element. You have to look at the lips, the nose, the hair, etc. You have to separate, discriminate, in effect, analyze, chop it into bits. Because just in one color, you can't take it all in. But meanwhile, you're roving back and forth. Your eyes are dotting from this point to this to this, pointing it together, synthesizing, uniting, integrating, you see. And that's what gives you the whole. Now, the ability to take in any complex whole for a human being involves this complexity. Take a book as a whole, for instance, as a completely different type of example. On the first obvious level, you separate, you analyze, you break up that whole into what kind of parts? Chapters. And you break the chapters up into sequences, say. You break the sequences up into paragraphs, and you break the paragraphs up into sentences. And the same principle is applicable throughout. You have to analyze, that is, break up, and that permits your limited screen to take in and deal with it the material. You break it down to units you can deal with, and at the same time then, you synthesize, you add up those units as you go to give you the total whole. Now, if you look at it this way, you can say that punctuation is really nothing but the analysis of sentences. It's really nothing but the analysis of sentences. It's the same principle of looking at a face, forming a concept, reading a book. It's the guide that tells you how to break up this whole of a sentence and thereby how to grasp its meaning. Now, obviously, you need such guides. And those guides can be rightly or wrongly placed. Now here I stress to you the analysis of a sentence is not arbitrary. It is not strictly a matter of quantity, that every ten words you stick a mark in because it's too many. It is not a matter of quantity only. It has to be determined by the meaning of the statement. You have to follow the logic of the sentence. You need to know how to break it up, how to analyze it, how to interuse it so that the actual meaning of the whole will emerge. And if you do the punctuation wrong, you'll break it up into units which will entirely change the meaning. Now look, for instance, at uh, the handout for lecture six, number one. Now this is a sentence which can have two entirely different meanings depending on its punctuation. Suppose you put a punctuation mark, a comma, say, after woman and after her. Then the sentence will read, woman, without her, man would be lost, right? And that would be one perfectly plausible, conceivable meaning. How else could you punctuate it to entirely change the meaning? Yeah. After a comma after without and a comma after man. A comma after woman and a comma after man, right. Woman, without her man, would be lost. You see, that entirely changes the concept being uh, proposed here. You cannot tell. Unpunctuated, there's no way to grasp the meaning of this sentence. It's ambiguous by its nature, but with punctuation, it becomes clear. So, that's a small example. This is a standard example from a logic text, but it's a simple example to see that you should not have a prejudice against punctuation. If grammar is how to put concepts together so as to form meaningful sentences, then punctuation is an essential element of that process. And you'll see that the rules of punctuation follow, in essence, from the principles of grammar we've already studied. Uh, and that's why you cover punctuation late in a course on grammar, because you have to know basic grammatical concepts before you can understand the rules of punctuation. Now, I want to discuss uh, one other preliminary matter, and that is... <coughs> You know Aristotle's theory of the golden mean, not too much and not too little? Well, in a way that applies to punctuation. There are two kinds of errors, or two improper extremes to watch for in regard to punctuation. One is no punctuation. That speaks for itself why that's an error. But the other is too much punctuation. You overdo it, and if you do, you would defeat your purpose. Why? 
if you have an excess of punctuation. Why would you? Yeah. Breaking it up into too many small units. Breaking it up into so many units that the mind would be defeated. It wouldn't achieve its purpose. Take, for example, breaking the chapter up into paragraphs. Now, one extreme would be no paragraphs at all. So the whole thing is one continuous paragraph. Why your mind would entirely go to pieces if you tried to face it. Just page after page without any indentation, no indication of a stopping point. You just couldn't take it in. It is vast, formidable block. But on the other hand, imagine an author for whom every sentence was a new paragraph. So it constantly started a paragraph with each new sentence. Then it would lose its capacity to help you unite. There would be too many units to deal with. It wouldn't be reducing units. The function would be pointing. Now, the same thing is true for punctuation. Look at number two, for instance, as an example of improper, excessive punctuation. Here an example of a comp. The jar, however, being light and, therefore, not round, was cost. And that's virtually after every word. Now, any one of those commas you could theoretically justify. But if you get a situation like this, the totality are flatly wrong. Because you keep in mind the purpose of punctuation, we are not giving a guide here to the crow of what to take in as a unit. We're virtually stopping after every <coughs> word, and therefore we're making useless the whole phenomenon of punctuation. There are in punctuation so-called light and heavy stuff. The light means less punctuation, fewer marks. The heavy means more. And there is a certain option that can't be mandatory because there is a human range of how much we can hold. But in the extreme of either are wrong. If you're over light, that means you're avoiding necessary marks. If you're over heavy, you're getting into this problem of number two. You're breaking it into so many units that we can't hold. Now, I may say that I myself favor light punctuation in one respect. I follow this principle. I never put in a mark where it's optional, only if it's mandatory. I never put a comma in, for instance, unless it's mandatory, or put it negatively. If there's any doubt, I omit the punctuation. Now, put it this way. My philosophy in this regard is what you call philosophy of copy editing, is the standard is small letters unpunctuated. That's the norm. Any departure from that, in my opinion, has to be justified by a specific reason. So if, and if you can't find that reason, I go back to small letters unpunctuated. For instance, should a word be started with a capital letter? Some words have to. But wherever I, I don't find a mandatory reason, I keep it small. The same with should a word be hyphenated. The same with should something be in italics. Any deviation, in other words, from Roman small letters unpunctuated, um, <coughs> requires, in my case, in my view, a specific justification. Otherwise, as I see it, it's a purposeless departure uh, and, and simply confuses you. Now, against that background, I want to turn to the comma, and that's really our subject for tonight. It's by far the most complex mark. I want to give you, in effect, the rules of using the comma, but not just, you know, churning out mechanically a whole series of rules, but try to relate what we're saying to the basic purpose of punctuation, so you'll be able to retain the rules and not see them as arbitrary. But I want, before we get to those rules, to answer one question. Some people have the idea you don't need to know the rules of the comma because you can simply go by the pause test, P-A-U-S-E. You know, the pause test is basically wherever you would pause in speaking or thinking, that's where you put a punctuation mark. And uh, wherever you would go one, two, three in speaking, you don't put a mark. That is the pause method of punctuating. Now, if that's true, then you don't need any rules. You just add, read your sentence to yourself, and if you pause, so on, if not, not. The trouble is that is not a valid method of punctuating for any mark, including the comma. 
one question and raises the question, how do you know when to pause? There may be a poor reader. You may have a subjective hang-up and pause where no pause is required. But the other thing is this. There once was a time, historically, that the pause test was invoked. There were four main punctuation marks, and they were correlated with four lengths of pause. The shortest was a comma. The, the second was a semicolon. The third was a, you know, colon. And the fourth was a period. And going across that series, you pause longer and longer periods of time. That is no longer true. The colon, for instance, is no longer part of this series at all. What does a colon mean today? Colon is not a mark indicating a length of pause. It's an entirely different kind of mark now. What? Something like the following is part of the list. A colon is, you know, that's two dots, one on top of the other. A colon now is specifically a mark for looking ahead. When you put a colon at the end of something, it amounts to saying, my reason is as follows. Or, you will understand this by looking at the following. And consequently, a colon is a very special type of mark, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about. So what we have now in terms of big marks are comma, semicolon, period. Those are the basic marks. And they do not necessarily correlate with pauses. Sometimes you need a comma or clarity in writing where you would not have any special pause in speaking. Because in speaking, you have other things like tone and pitch to communicate your meaning. According to the rules of punctuation, as they're now operative in English, <coughs> um, the rules for using these marks are entirely a matter of grammar, not of rhetoric, not of how long you would pause, but of the nature of this division between one unit and the other. The smallest logical separation is marked by a comma. The smallest logical separation, even if you don't give them a lot of time and pause. Is when two elements have to be separated, but they're logically as close as you can get to being one, that's the role of a comma. The largest possible separation between units, when you're saying to your reader, in effect, that's the end, this is a biggie, we're starting all over again, is a period. And the middle of the rotor is a semicolon. Uh, now, understanding that, let us turn to the main rules of the comma with a little occasional excursions to the other marks for contrast or clarification. Number one. These are what the comma is for. To separate main clauses from one another. To separate main clauses from one another. Main clauses. Now there's all kinds of qualifications, but let's get the idea first. Look at number three. I went to the bank and the teller told me I was bankrupt. How many main clauses in that sentence? Two. 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 And what is the conjunction that unites them? And how do you know that these are main clauses and not subordinate? And that one is not a subordinate clause. Yes. They stand alone. They well, they can stand alone, and also you know that and is a what type of conjunction? A coordinating conjunction. All right. That is the type of situation where you have a comma after bank, and the comma is regarded as mandatory in this type of situation, because you have two main clauses. The next is another example of the same thing. Jack came into the room, for Harry did not want to go. Here again, two main clauses separated by the coordinating conjunction for, therefore, a comma ending the first. Now, the theory behind this type of comma is the punctuation has to be a mark indicating the structure, how to analyze into subdivisions. Well, if anything is going to be a subdivision, a main clause has to be. You see. And therefore, if you're going to break up a sentence at all, you must do so at the essential dividing line. And the essential dividing line, when you have two main clauses, is where one ends and the other begins. 
Your comma here amounts to giving the reader the essence of your structure. You're saying so and so and so and so, or so and so but so and so. And that comma tells them end of unit one, but because it's a comma, it's the smallest separation. So you're keeping the compound sentence. You're telling them take it in as one unit, but it has two subdivisions. Notice also that by its nature, this type of comma before the uh, conjunction is almost always essential for clarity. Imagine there was no comma after bank. How could it be easily read? I went to the bank and the teller. And you would take teller as where you went, and then you'd suddenly see toll. And then you have to stop and say, oh God, the teller is the subject of toll, and not the object of uh, the preposition to. But by the comma, you're telling your reader what? This is the end of the first thought. Now we're starting over. You see. You're making it clear that this is a conjunction introducing a new sentence, a new clause. Uh, the same would be, imagine no comma after room. Jack came into the room for Harry. You see, right away, the reader would have to go back. Now, if you ever run a sentence which requires the reader to go to a certain point and say, uh-oh, and go back and start again, that is your fault and that is considered poor. The reader should be able to read right through without ever going back. And one essential function of punct proper punctuation is to guide him as he goes along so he know what words are to be taken with which. And when you have two main clauses, uh, one function of separating them by commas here is always to tell you this is the end of the unit. Now, this applies to main clauses, this rule, separated by coordinating conjunctions. Now, how many coordinating conjunctions are there? Pure coordinating conjunctions. This goes back to lecture what? Two or three. How many? Then you guess if you don't remember. Simple. Close. Six. What are they? And? But? Four? No, 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 because of the subordinate. And they're always short. If they're more than one syllable, they could never be coordinated. You could have to trip off or, or, nor, yet. That's it. And, but, for, or, nor, yet. Now that's the main rule, but there's lots of qualifications, exceptions, and variations possible. So let's look at some within this first rule. If the main clauses are short and very closely connected in thought, no punctuation is necessary. Now this, is all, this kind of qualification will apply to almost all rules of punctuation. I'll often tell you, this is the rule, unless the thing is short. Now, why do you think brevity, per se, often eliminates the need for any punctuation? The brevity of the unit. Yes, they can be taken in, they can be taken in as one unit. That's right. It's so small, it's making a needless production out of making a separate unit out of it because it easily attaches to the proceeding. It's no extra strain on the pro epistemology. Look, for instance, at the number three, the next item. He ate and he drank until he fainted. Now, here's how many clauses. How many clauses in that sentence? Including all types of clauses. Three. He ate, he drank, he fainted. Now, how many main clauses? Two. It's connected by and, and of course, until he fainted is a subordinate clause, right? Although we have three clauses, including two main ones here, they're so short that it's unnecessary to break them up. You can take that in in one scan without any difficulty. So we have that, that partial exception to the rule. And on the premise of omit unless it's mandatory, I would never put them in unless there's something accomplished by it. If there was a context in which he ate and he drank were so separate you know, that he was eating ordinary food, but he was drinking hemlock, and the audience knew, and you want to pause and say he ate, and he drank, then you might put commas in for some special emphasis, but in the normal case, you wouldn't. 
Now, one other situation. Let me just ask, are you warm? Yes. 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 No. 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 You want to open some of those baskets? <laughs> you guys just open the door basket. Yeah. It's very warm up here. <laughs> but just to think for a minute. Because it's very warm up here. <laughs> Still discussing separating main clauses. There is a situation in which you are entitled to separate main clauses by a semicolon rather than by a comma. If you have a special reason. Now look at the last item under number three. He asked for the answer, but I did not know. What is accomplished by that semicolon after answer rather than by a comma? Now this is an exceptional punctuation because normally two main clauses separated by but would have to have a comma. But what does this semicolon accomplish that a comma does not? Various. Gives a allows for a greater pause, gives a little more emphasis. Yes, it gives a longer pause, and by that fact, a greater emphasis to the second half. It amounts to this. He asked for the answer, but alas, I didn't have it. It almost gives a tragic overtone uh, to the second, as though you're saying, focus on this, this has an extra weight, take it a little slower as opposed to just he asked, but I didn't know. You see? Now, if you have a special situation where you want to stress your second one in that way, you can slow it down with the semicolon, but there has to be a separate reason. Yes? Doesn't the semicolon make the conjunction unnecessary? It does not make the conjunction unnecessary. It makes situations in which it's not required to express it. But in this case, he wants to indicate the idea of but, which is an exception to what was expected before. There are cases, which I'm going to get to right now, where no conjunction is used at all to connect main clauses. Now that's a different situation. We've been talking so far about separating main clauses which are connected by a conjunction, right? And we said you have to have a comma. And now let's look at another situation. Suppose no conjunction at all is used. Just the first clause and then the second clause. Look at number four now. Now here we have two main clauses, right? Each are separate, <coughs> self-contained statements. We want them to be treated as one sentence, a compound sentence. But we have no conjunction. It's not as though we said nearly half past five and but, etc. In that situation, the rule is you have to use a semicolon, as we have here. Now, why? Well, the alternative would be a period and a comma. If you put the period in, then of course you lose the idea of taking them in as one thought. And we want, let us say, to combine the two into one overall thought. We want to have that unity which the period gives, for which the compound sentence gives us. So a period after five wasn't achieved. Could we have a comma after five in this situation? No, you could. Why not? Well, um, you want to have a difference in emphasis. Uh, having the semicolon with the we gives you a greater pause than having a comma. Well, it, it gives you a greater pause, but the main reason is without a conjunction, there's no guide to the ground. If we just have, it is nearly half past five comma we, you do not have any idea what type of thing is coming. And it is nearly half past five, we know, or is it a parenthetical remark, is it a full clause, what is it? Uh, therefore, if you want to indicate a main clause is coming, if we had a, a comma and a conjunction like and or but, that would do it. But if we don't have a conjunction, our only means of indicating another main clause is coming as a semicolon. And that's the reason uh, for that rule. 
Now you see here, in number four, the same sentence, done in three ways. The first with a semicolon. The second has two separate full sentences. The third has what? Two main clauses separated by a comma and a coordinating conjunction. Now this example is taken from Strunk and White, that's what the S and W is. And of course it's optional depending on your meaning. But I'll read you what they say, which I think is very plausible. The comparison of these three forms shows clearly the advantage of the first. It's better than the second because it suggests a close relationship between the two stages in a way that the second does not. The second just tells you one, two. But by pointing the semicolon, you say treat them as a unit, as a logical connection between the two. But he goes on, it's better than the third because it's briefer and more forceful. You don't have to say the and. The simple semicolon covers the unit. Now, in cases where the actual content of the conjunction is implied and is not essential, you don't want to stress your but or for or whichever, in that case, the tersus is just put a semicolon in without any uh, conjunction. He concludes, this simple method, uh, that is the semicolon between main clauses, is one of the most useful devices of composition. Now, there's one other theoretical situation in regard to main clauses. Do you remember there are other types of connective words besides pure conjunctions, but that nevertheless can be used to connect main clauses? What am I thinking of? Does anybody remember? There's a whole list of words used to connect main clauses, not subordinate clauses, but main clauses, which are nevertheless not coordinating conjunctions. And I'm thinking of words like accordingly, however, besides, therefore, etc., etc. What were those words called? Adverbial conjunctions. Adverbial conjunctions. Now, in this case, too, you need a semicolon when you connect main clauses by an adverbial conjunction. Look at number five. He asked if we wanted to leave. Semi. Therefore, we took the elephant. Now, why couldn't you have a comma after leave? Why couldn't you say, he asked if we wanted to leave, comma, therefore, comma, we took the elephant. <laughs> well, it, it would leave open. What is the therefore go with? He asked if he wanted to leave therefore. Now, therefore, being an adverb, not a pure conjunction, can look back as well as forward. You see? And that being the case, you have to have a mark stopping you and saying, this element, therefore, goes with what's coming, not with what came before. That's the role of the semicolon uh, in this case. A conjunction doesn't require it. A conjunction purely unites equal elements. And since we know that, we don't need to be stopped by a semicolon. But an adverb functioning as a conjunction could be taken with the first part rather than with the second. So we have to, by its nature, stop. But we want to keep the whole sentence as a single unit, so our, our option is a semicolon. And then we go on. Now I will therefore sum up. There are three situations for main clause. Separated by a coordinating conjunction, the mark is a comma. But in the other two cases, that is, no, con no, no conjunction at all, or an adverbial conjunction, the mark is a semicolon. Okay? Did you say it once more? There are three situations for punctuating main clauses in relation to each other. If they are separated by a coordinating conjunction, they are separated by a comma. If there is no conjunction or an adverbial conjunction, they require a semicolon. That really is not difficult. And you see there is a logic this is not at all arbitrary. There really would be no other way of doing it, given the nature 
of what you're trying to accomplish and the nature of the connections that you have to work with. All right, let's go to a second major rule of comma usage. And that is to separate parenthetical elements from the essence of the thought. To separate parenthetical elements from the essence of the thought. Now here again is basically an issue of structure. We're analyzing the sentence into its elements. But now we're not talking about having two equally important elements, two main clauses that were separate. Here our analysis or our division is between an essential and an unimportant, a main point and a side issue. Wherever a word, a phrase, or a clause is a side issue, a parenthetical element, it needs to be set off. There are exceptions, but that's the general rule. Now, when we call something a side issue, this is a grammatical term. In other words, it may be very interesting, it may be important, it may be crucial. But if it's not essential to the grammar of the sentence, it qualifies as a par parenthesis. Remember, it's a structural issue. We're punctuating to show the logic of the sentence. <clears throat> Your commas here are giving the reader guidance to how to read the sentence. By putting commas around a parenthetical element, however interesting, important, or essential it is in its content, you are telling the reader, in effect, don't mix this in with the main structure of the sentence. This is a unit in itself. Don't confuse it with the essential structure of the main clause. Now, one situation where it's mandatory is if you have a long introductory element before your sentence gets started. A long introductory phrase or clause before your main clause gets started should have to be set off by a comma according to this rule. Now look at number six, the first sentence. Given the huge number of Americans who do not belong to any union, we have a good chance of combating the influence of the AFL-CIO. Why do you require a comma after union? What does the comma tell us? The comma tells us, if you put it into words, what does it tell you? What does it tell you? Yeah. Well, to pause because it's at the end of the introductory unit and here's Tells the main part. Your introduction is over. The main clause is coming. The main structure element is coming. And sure enough, we have a good chance of combating the influence is your main clause. So the comma tells you when you get to this point, you, need, you can add it up and make that your qualification because now we're coming to the main thing. That's that's an essential to reading this clearly, given that we have a limited ability to take in work. Yes? What happens when there are, in effect, two clauses in the, the introductory clause itself has a subordinating clause in it before you get to the main clause? Do you in certain situations, commas, you, have you, have you have to have commas within commas. No, no, you have to have commas within commas. You have to separate the long one and then a short one. Suppose, for instance, Given the huge number, comma, and I mean huge, comma, of Americans who do not belong to any union, comma, you have an interpolation within your interpolation. You have to put the commas in too. That's okay if your content is a warrant. If you overdo that, of course, the reader can't take it in. But, you know, within normal usage, that's perfectly okay. Now, let me give you, I didn't bother typing them up, but let me give you a sentence, and you tell me by this criterion of setting off sizable introductory elements. You see, they may be important, they may be essential to the thought, but they're grammatically parenthetical. The main clause can get along without them. You tell me where the comma would go. 
As I dived into my swimming pool last Sunday, I saw a car pull away from the garage. After Sunday. After Sunday. That's an adverbial modifier, and the main cause starts, I saw. So you put a comma in there, telling the reader, start over, be fresh for the main plot, all of that introduction is now over. Now this is true uh, even for just a phrase. Here's a sentence starting with a participial phrase. Have we run around the block for days? I was tired. Where would the comma have to go? After days. After days, right. Now here again, our typical qualification. After a short phrase or clause, commas are not necessary. For instance, in the afternoon he takes a walk. Now, in the afternoon is an introductory phrase, but it's so short, it's three words, that in the normal case you go right on. Remember, the purpose is to enable the crow to function, and if it's that short, there's no strain on our ability to take it in at one glance, no need for a comma, unless you want special emphasis. Remember, whatever the last word before a comma gives it more emphasis before a punctuation mark. So if you wanted, you could put a comma. In the afternoon, it takes a walk. And you put a comma there for emphasis. But in the normal case, absolutely unnecessary. Now, here is a case where you can have a whole clause, which is short and no comma or clause. If I come, I can stay until noon. And there's nothing, there's no rule that you must put a comma wherever a clause ends. This is if I come, a subordinate clause, it's brief, it's three words, it's easy as pie to take in, no comma is required. All right, now continuing this rule of a comma to set off parenthetical elements. The other situation is when you have an element stuck in the middle of your main clause. Here is at the beginning before it starts. The second and other situations where you have an element in the middle of the main clause, inserted into the main grammar. Now you may ask me, what about at the end? Wouldn't that theoretically be a third place? No. There's no need to set off parenthetical elements at the end of the sentence. You know why? Because you already know the main clause. So there's nothing that you have to worry about. If I say, I saw a burglar as I entered my apartment last Sunday, I got the main clause. I saw a burglar by the time I get to the subordinate, so there's no problem. So no, no comma is required to set off modifiers at the end. The rule is at the beginning and in the middle. Parenthetic home is at the beginning and in the middle. Now let's take some examples of the middle. Look at number six, the next item. His mouth, though filled with peanuts, still issued commands. Okay, his mouth, though filled with peanuts, still issued commands. Now why is a comma, what function does it have around though filled with peanuts? What is the structure of this main clause? The subject is mouth, and the verb is issued. So here we have a qualification stuck in the middle between subject and verb, which means really inserted into the essence of the grammar, right? When you do that, putting commas around, it says to your listener, in effect, the main structure is around these commas. This is stuck in the middle. If you want the main structure, we get around the commas. You see. And that's, therefore, again, a structural mark. Or look at the next. He will, without any hesitation, betray his country. Here we have an element inserted between what two words? Will, which is... The auxiliary and betray, which is the verb forms that we have right in the middle of the verb. We've broken up an essential element of the main clause. And in order to indicate that the structure has been temporarily interrupted and then resumed, we put commas, and that tells the reader without any hesitation as a side issue. The main grammar is he will betray. Uh, well, these give you examples of the main use of commas as separators of parentheses. Yes. I haven't indicated before that, it, that it, last week that it was wrong to split your uh, form 
corporations unnecessarily? Or unnecessarily, but sometimes it's necessary. And if it's necessary, you then will separate the parentheses by commas, or by some other mark. Now, I want to cover one thing under this issue of uh, parentheses. Do you remember that there were words that we called sentence modifiers or clause modifiers? They were adverbs that had the function of modifying a whole sentence or a whole clause. Like however, that is, etc. Therefore, as part of this rule of parentheses, all such words have to be set off by commas. Words that modify sentences or clauses as a whole are not part of the grammar and therefore have to be set off by commas. Now look, for example, at the last item under six. We sang, that is, until it was dark. Now that is, is what's called a sentence modifier. It doesn't modify just sang or, or until, it modifies the entire, we sang until it was dark. This, in other words, it tells us is an explanation of something that came before, right? So that is functions as the unit modifying the whole sentence. And in such a case, it is, has to be set in commas, as you would put therefore in commas, or however in commas, any word that to be taken with the whole sentence to indicate this is not an integral element of the grammar. It's a side issue, even though it, it, it tells you something important about the whole sentence. Look how you would read it, for instance, if you took the commas up. How could you misread it if there were no commas? We sang that is. We sang that is. In fact, you would take it as the object of sang. And this is true of most of these sentence modifiers. Uh, if you don't put commas around them, you will ha tend to take them as modifying the preceding word rather than the total sentence. By putting commas around, you tell, you're telling your reader, this does not go right with the preceding word. It's not an essential part of the grammar. It takes the whole sentence. That it, that it modifies. And this is the basic reason why all those conjunctive adverbs that we discussed have to have commas around them in the normal usage. If you look back, for instance, to number five, you see I have a comma after therefore? That's part of this rule. Commas around therefores, however, uh, in the first place, finally, perhaps, to tell the truth, for example, all of those things would go with a whole sentence or a whole plot. Yes. Um, is this time to ask about the use of parentheses? No. <laughs> yes. When you're talking about howevers and therefores in this context, are they still adverbial conjunctions when they're sentence modifiers? They're conjunctions except if it's not punctuated into the preceding clause, it's a conjunction one step removed because it's functioning as a transition to keep you related to the preceding thought. But you don't, you're not technically a conjunction because we started a new sentence and the conjunction functions within elements which are part of the same sentence. So technically speaking, they're not, but they, they actually function that same way. Yes? You have to use the commas. In the normal case, you have to. But I'm going to give you exceptions in a moment. If you take one, it's very short. Yes. All right. We got on to my next point. Where the insert, and this, this now I'm going to give you exceptions to the rules I've just given you about friends. Where an insert is brief, would in no way confuse the grammar. You do not require a comma. This is the same rule. If it's brief and it doesn't cause any trouble, a comma isn't necessary. <laughs> For instance, your contribution will, of course, be appreciated. What is the sentence modifier in there? What element modifies the whole sentence? 
portal. Of course. Now, you can put commas around, but you don't have to. It's very brief, and it wouldn't, it's no way of, there's no way of misreading it, or confusing it. So you can just leave it up. If you put commas around, of course, what effect does it have? It slows you down a bit, and therefore makes, of course, jump out of the page. It makes it more, it makes it a, the difference between reading it. Your contribution will, of course, be appreciated, and your contribution will, of course, be appreciated. The commas have the effect of slowing you down a bit on each side and therefore emphasize. But they're not required if it's that type of brief situation. A second exception. We've already covered this. Do you remember the situation where we said uh, so and so I thought was, we inserted, I thought, he said, etc. That type of insert uh, does not permit commas in the ordinary case. For instance, the book which I thought he was reading, after the relative pronoun, we discussed that last time. Uh, the book which I thought he was reading, the I thought book, is a parenthetical element stating his state of mind. And any such parenthetical element does not take commas in English because it's so short, it's built right into the main thought. So you would say the book which I thought, or the book which she said, or the book which they believed, any of those little inserted mental state uh, parentheses do not take commas. Is that an issue of whether it's restrictive or not restrictive? No. Your, your question so far easy to answer because it take a flat <laughs> <laughs> a third exception, if you can take this in. Uh, this is a rule that Fowler puts forth, and I think a very nice rule. It's a, it's a fine point, so you would lose a great deal by failing it, but... Do not use commas to set off negative adverbs. For instance, he will, under no circumstances, go home. Now, the negative adverbial phrase there is, under no, under no, under no circumstances. circumstances. If you put commas around that, what do you tend to make your reader take in? He will go home, under no circumstances. But you're giving him a positive thought as your main structure, when actually the negative here is essential and to the very grammar because it negates the whole idea. And therefore, he says, if you have a negative modifier, don't separate it by commas because it's so crucial to the meaning that you're going to give him the reverse intention if you separate it by commas. Now, there are many lesser points where there are exceptions because of emphasis. You want a comma even though it's not required because you want to slow it down. You don't want a comma because you have too many, so even though it's mandatory, you leave it out. I'm, I'm not trying to give you an exhaustive list, but if you keep in mind the basic function of a comma, and then overlay that with your special purposes in a specific context, you should be able to come up with a reasonable explanation in any given case whether you, why you do or don't use a comma. Now, in discussing parenthetical elements, there is one last point to make here. Suppose you decide that a certain element is a side issue, not part of the main graph. I've talked so far as though the only way to handle that is indicated by commas. But actually, there are two other kinds of marks that you can use to indicate a side issue. Now, what are the two other kinds of marks beside a comma that indicate a parenthetical issue? One is parentheses, you know, a curve one way and a curve the other way at the beginning and the end. What is another one? Dash. Dashes on each side. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is often asked, how do you know when to use which? When you have a parenthetical element, when do you use commas? When do you use dashes? When do you use parentheses? And the answer is really very simple. 
How important is your side remark? How much emphasis do you want to give? Which of those three marks gives it the greatest emphasis? Gives it the greatest importance? Dashes. A dash means a break or rupture in the thought. And therefore the grant. <clears throat> it's like slashing off the thought stopping the grammar and saying, oh, to hell with that, I've got something more important to say. And therefore, within dashes, you can do pretty much anything you want, and then you pick up again much later. But the dash has the effect of saying goodbye to the beginning. We've got something crucial here. And consequently, it conveys to the reader this is something important. This is a side remark, but it's so important it's stopping my grammar and therefore pay attention. Now look, for instance, at number seven. There is the same sentence three times. The standard case is simply the comma. The comma tells you we got two choices, U.S. foreign policy or the lack. There's the cause of Russia's success. I don't care. Take your pick, maybe it's one or the other. It's on a pot. That's the normal standard case. The next one says, in effect, what? U.S. foreign policy. Stop everything, or the lack of it. Okay, now we can continue. And by making the dash there, what are you saying? Yes. U.S. foreign policy is the lack. Yeah, you're saying, in effect, this is so important, I thought I have to correct myself. Actually, we don't have a foreign policy. This is more correct. Pause on this, take it in. Now, I'm overdoing it, but the effect of the dash is is to signal the reader, this is a big issue, even though a side issue to your grammar, but nevertheless a big issue. So, if it's that important, you use dashes. Unless, of course, you are the type of reader or writer who does not know any other techniques of emphasis and therefore puts everything in dashes. If you do that, don't do it. <laughs> Better to give yourself the rule, never use dashes at all. Now, I have a tendency to use overuse dashes because it's so easy. You don't have to think what mark to put, just put a dash. But then in one step of editing, I always go over and weed out dashes. I cut them down and cut them down until there is not a dash in every consecutive sentence. And ideally, there shouldn't be anything near that many because it's an issue of too much emphasis. So if the norm is commas, the big emphasis is dashes. In the other direction, the least is Parentheses. Now those marks, those two round marks, tell the reader in effect, this idea is very, very loosely connected to what I'm saying. It's really off the point. It's barely connected, just enough to make it into the sentence. So if I say it, uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy or lack is the cause of Russia's success, it amounts to saying in effect, I know that this idea of lack of it might occur to you, but that's not my subject for you see. I'm talking about foreign policy. Now, if you get that, you have no problem. Where there's doubt, where you don't have a clear issue of emphasis or throwing it away, the standard norm is a comma. I may say, by the way, of these, the worst to overuse is parentheses. Parentheses tells you this is insignificant. Well, if it's that insignificant, it raises the big question, why is it there? Now, there are cases where you have to acknowledge something. It's a mandatory clarification. But you absolutely can't and don't want to discuss it or give it the emphasis of even a main clause or a subordinate clause. So you have to mention it, but you want to throw it away. That's OK occasionally. If you do it too much, there's something basically wrong with your argument or your approach. And the solution is to go over each parenthesis and decide to upgrade it or to delete the material altogether. Now, if you want to know a book that is, in my experience, the worst violator of this rule, 
uh, beloved by the critics at the time it came out because it was a violator of this rule. It was a book written basically in parentheses. And that was by James Gould Cousins called By Love Possessed, of which every sentence, as I remember the part I was able to slog through, was filled with parentheses and parentheses, and it was simply intolerable uh, to read because you couldn't figure out what was he trying to say beside all these parentheses. <laughs> so I caution you not to overdo um, uh, parentheses. Yes. Um, it's what, uh, are brackets a substitute for parentheses? Two kinds of brackets. Square brackets are a different type of thing. They're not called parentheses, they're called brackets like this. And they have special uses. They are not the type of parentheses. If you have a parenthesis within a parenthesis, then you put square inside of round or round inside of square. And there are other uses for square brackets as you're quoting someone. And you want to indicate that certain words are yours, not his. You put square brackets around them. But that's a copy editor thing. The main punctuation mark is round parentheses. Yes. Then you use for the slash mark. A mark like this? Yes. You want me to go into an all-purpose discussion of all punctuation <laughs> marks, and I'm discussing no. only commas tonight. Well, I've heard this in connection with parentheses. And, uh, well, how would you You mean the, the right. uh, diagonal? Yeah, yeah. How would you use that one? In, as it was suggested as an alternative to some parentheses used. Yes. Where? I, I can't imagine how. Give me a situation where you use a slash. Slash is like and, slash, or. <laughs> You mean that type well, of no, slash? No, that's, that's another use of it, but that wasn't what I was Well, give me an example. Just, as, a, just as parentheses. Never heard of that. I don't know of any such use of the slash to separate parenthetical okay. material. All right. If you can take one more theory before the break, one more element of theory, let us go to number three. By far the trickiest use of the comma. It separates, I was going to say the men for the boys, but that may be regarded as male shortness. <laughs> yeah. And that is the comma to set off non-restrictive modifiers. To set off non-restrictive modifiers. If you get this, the trickiest situation with regard to the use of a comma will be child's play. If you don't, you will wallow forever. So this is like the climax of the comma. Now, to explain this, we go back to a topic I introduced you to last time. Look at number eight. This is the exact example that we had last time in connection with who, which, and that. Uh, and I deliberately introduced it last time so you'd have some familiarity with it, the part about grand piano. Remember we said there were two types of relative clause. Restrictive and non-restrictive. Grand pianos come, which are uncommon come, are necessary to modern orchestra. In grand pianos, no comma, which are out of two, no comma, are a performer's nightmare. Now we said one of these are restricted, is restrictive, and one is not. Which is the restrictive of the two? Second. The second. What does it mean to say it is restricted? It's crucial to the comprehension of the sentence. It is essential, in this case, to the subject, and therefore to the grasping of the sentence. You don't pause when you read it. It gives you the heart of the subject. And you can tell even in reading. The absence of commas means you read it in a definite way, you would say. Grand pianos, which are out of tune, are a performer's nightmare. You wouldn't say grand pianos, which are out of tune, are a performer's nightmare. You run the pianos, which, right into each other because you want to make it clear you're talking about a specific type of grand piano. Not all grand pianos, but the grand pianos are of two. That's your thought. That's essential to your subject. Therefore, which out of tune restricts the subject. And therefore, 
rule is you do not put commas around. Why not? This is really a development of the second rule of commas. Because it's essential, it is not parenthetical. It is required to grasp the subject of your sentence. So this is really just a development of rule two. If you understand that a restrictive clause is not parenthetical, then you understand that a restrictive clause has no commas. On the other hand, and by the same reasoning, a non-restrictive clause is a side issue. It is not essential to your subject. It is a parenthesis, and therefore by the rule that you put commas around parentheses, it does have a comma. So for instance, grand pianos, comma, which are uncommon, are unnecessary to modern orchestra. And here I'm telling you, my thought is, what? Grand pianos are necessary. Oh, by the way, they're un uncommon. But I am not saying one type of grand piano is necessary. If I had no commas there in that first sentence, what would the meaning be? Rare grand There's two types of grand pianos, uncommon and ordinary. The uncommon ones are necessary, but the ordinary ones, I guess, aren't. Now, that is obviously not the thought. His thought is grand pianos as such, any kind, are necessary. And then he says, you know, another thing about them, but this is a side issue. They're very uncommon. The commas indicate this is not restricted. It is not essential. It's a side issue. And therefore, uh, we put them in to the commas that indicate parenthetical. And you see, in reading it, you pause to let your listener know. Grand pianos, which are uncommon, you even let your voice rise a bit to show I'm throwing this away. This is not my key point. Whereas if it was restricted, you'd say grand pianos, which are uncommon. You keep the momentum and the tone going to let your signal, your listener, it's all one you, you see. Now, if you understand that, the rule is very simply this. A relative clause, which is non-restrictive, must be surrounded by commas. That simply, you see, is the development of the rule that the parenthetical elements have to be separated by commas. And the other half of this rule is a relative clause which is restrictive cannot be surrounded by commas. Since it is restrictive, it is one unit, and the commas would su suggest a separation which is false, and therefore they are, they are simply wrong. So if it's non-restrictive, you have to have commas, and if it's restrictive, you can't have commas. They are essential to explain the meaning. Now, one use I do want to show you, one, one error I want to set to rest here. Number nine is a, a sentence that would never be permitted. What is wrong? Number nine commits a fallacy or an error that is never justified, whether your meaning is restrictive or unrestricted. What is the error? There? Well, suppose they mean it as non-restricted. Suppose they mean a grand piano is a needless luxury. And by the way, a grand piano is expensive. So it's, the main thought is a grand piano is a needless luxury, any one. In that case, it would be non-restrictive, so the commas are okay. It's not, the error is not the comma per se, if the meaning is non-restrictive. But the error is in something else, David. Well, you need the word which instead of that, wrong pronoun. You cannot use the relative pronoun that after a comma. Why not? It introduces a fatal ambiguity into the sentence because that has another use too, and the comma urges people to take it in its other sense. Namely what? That is. 
or even not just that is, but what use if I say that, that, uh, we call the demonstrative pronoun. A comma before a that leaves wide open. Is it relative or demonstrative? And most people would naturally read this, a grand piano. That is expensive. Taking it in the pointy sense of that rather than as a pronoun referring to uh, uh, the preceding noun. And consequently, the rule is, if you're going to separate a phrase by commas, it must be which or who, it can't be that. And this is one of the main factors that Fowler used as to why that should be for restrictive clauses, and which for non-restrictive, because you can't have a comma anyway before that. So you may as well then, he says, make the that all uh, the restrictive, and the which with commas all the non-restrictive. But number nine, in any event, is definitely wrong. All right, leaving aside that, the whole trick in applying this rule of restrictive versus non-restrictive is to be able to tell one from the other. If you can do it, you have no problem. If you can't, you'll flounder forever. Books give you tests how to tell whether a relative clause is restrictive or non-restrictive. For instance, one test, I don't know if you need to copy these down, this is a kind of elementary tests, you know, for beginning grammarians or beginning students. One test is omit the clause and see if the sentence still makes sense. For instance, look at number eight again. Grand pianos are necessary to modern orchestras. Well, that makes sense, which are uncommon as a side issue. But grand pianos are a performer's nightmare. Well, it's not clear cut, maybe the guy is saying it's terrible ever to use them, but it doesn't make that much sense. So it gives you a clue that without this clause, uh, the sentence doesn't stand. Another test is, now this is getting to be very mechanical. Drop the punctuation and substitute and and a personal pronoun and see if it makes sense. Grand piano and they are uncommon, are necessary. Well, you could do that. But grand pianos, and they are out of tune, are a nightmare, would not. Now, if you need that, okay, but that's in the, in the nature of a crutch. Essentially, I would say, you have to go over these examples, uh, over these cases, and try and judge from the logic of the context and your intention. Do you or do you not intend the relevant clause to be restricted? Now, we're going to take a break now, but number 10 gives you six. I'd like you to look at them if you get a chance in the next 10 minutes or so and decide. Would you or would you not put a comma around the relevant clauses here? In some cases, it's possible either way, but your meaning has changed completely. In some cases, it would be senseless one way or the other. See if you can work out some of them, and we're going to do those right as part of this as soon as we take a break. All right, let us look at number 10 and analyze these from the aspect of restrictive versus non-restrictive relative clauses. The relative clause in the first is who live in class house. Yes or no for the commas? Raise your hand if you have an idea one way or the other. Sorry. No. No commas. In other words, you regard this as restricted, essential to the subject. The subject is not people, but people who live in glass houses. What would it mean if you put commas around? Is it all people living glass houses? Yes, it would mean that your main thought is people as such shouldn't throw stones because they all live in glass houses. You would be saying people, and they're the type of things that live in glass houses, shouldn't throw stones. All people are vulnerable, whereas this obviously does not mean that. So in other words, this is a simple example of the point 
that the putting in of the comma changes the meaning decisive to putting in of the omission. And in the ordinary use of this, if you're not a skeptic or a cynic who regards all people as corrupt by nature, commas are inherently wrong. Now, what about the next? The relative clause is, which is parked in the garage. Now, yes or no? Comma or no comma? I'm going to get the <laughs> Do you want a semicolon? No, I want it depending. <laughs> I want to get yes, it over so depending. It has two entirely different meanings. You can imagine a situation of either, but the point is it's a different meaning. Now, let's get somebody here uh, on the couch in the center. Yes. Yes, it's uh, restricted. So, restricted, you say, it should have no commas around. I mean, it's, no, it's non restricted. Well, should, which one is it? It should have commas. Non restrictive, it should have commas around. So, it should be your new car, which is parked in the garage, is badly dented. In which case, your main thought is your new car is, is dented. And by the way, it's in the garage. How many new cars do you have on that interpretation? One. One. But now, could you punctuate it in the opposite way for a different meaning? In other words, make it uh, restrictive rather than non-restrictive. In other words, just the way it is right there. In which case, it has which meaning? Yes. Well, if you have two new cars, then right. that will stipulate which one it is. You have to have two new cars to interpret it the other way. Or more. Two or more. And then you say to the person, some of your new cars are in your home in Florida, some of your new cars are, you know, in Atlantic City in front of the gambling casino, but your new car, which is parked in the garage, is badly dead. Now, in that interpretation, it is restricted, because the subject is not your one new car, but a particular your new car. Yeah. Would it be a good idea, just because of confusion about this, to, to not do it that way, even if you mean no. obstructive use, to say the one No, we... absolutely not. It is not a good idea to violate the rules of grammar because they're not false. No, I don't mean don't violate it. I mean it's to say the one. No, it's not necessary. Mm. This is clear enough and still in common enough usage among educated people, so you do not go out of your way to say, I've done it correctly, I've made that being unmistakable, but if you're illiterate on top of that, here's a footnote to clarify. <laughs> now, next. Who were good? Is that restrictive or non restrictive? Somebody different. Yes. Restrictive. Restrictive, so you say no come. Well, what? Because only the children who wore the, the ice cream got it. Only the children who what? Who were good got the ice cream. Only the children who were good. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine an opposite situation? That you gave it to every single child in this situation. Because what? Every one of them was good. Now, in that case, it would be non-restricted. The thought would be, she spent her time feeding ice cream to the children. And by the way, every one of them were good. If you put a comma after, that's what you'd be saying. Without a comma, you're saying, what? She uh, spent her time feeding ice cream to one subset, the children who were good. And they had to be contrasted to the kids who weren't, and they didn't get ice cream. So it entirely changes the meaning. One sentence tells you all the children were good, and the other tells you only some were. Now, if you're talking, uh, writing, or speaking in a context where these distinctions between all and some make a difference, and in many cases it's essential, you can subvert and destroy your entire meaning by the wrong use of common. This is the really sensitive use, whether it's restrictive or non-restrictive. But I want you to see from these exercises I put so many in because people seem to have difficulty with this. But I put so many in because um, uh, 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 is an, uh, it's an essential to get some facility in distinguishing these. Look at the next. That Jack got. Restrictive or non restrictive? Yes. Well, you say restrictive, which means no commas. 
If so, what is your meaning? The meaning is, Jack got a number of ideas, but the best of his ideas was to go dance, right? So, it's essentially part. It's not the best idea as such, but the best idea that Jack got. Now, what would you do if you put commas around that Jack got? It's a perfectly legitimate sentence, but it has a completely different meaning. What does it mean when you put that Jack up, which makes it parenthetical? Yes? Several people had ideas, but this happens to be Jack. Yes. If you put commas around it, it means the best idea was to go dance. Hey, Jack was the guy who got the best idea. Whereas the first one, it means the best idea that Jack got was to go dancing. But Tony's idea to go eating was even better. You see the difference? Whether it's restrictive or non-restrictive, yes. If you put the comma in, don't you have to change the action? Yes, you absolutely must. Right. You cannot, this is the rule that you can't have a comma before. That is a relative pronoun. I'm glad you pointed that out, absolutely. Yes? Even if you leave it out, uh, it would be all right to have it uh, non-restrictive in this kind of a context. Well, if you leave it out, it can't be non-restrictive. But I'm saying, in this particular context, it would still be clear. It's not it would be a different meaning. <laughs> essentially a different meaning. If you put the commas in or leave them out. Well, I'm, I'm offering this as, as an exception to that rule because... Uh, what? It's, well, brevity... Uh, no, 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 but there's a different interpretation, which I just mentioned, which uh, would not be carried carry if you leave it out. When you put it this way, it means we're talking about Jack's idea. I understand that. And the same the best was this way. Whereas if you put commas around, you are saying there's a whole series of ideas. I'm not committing myself to which was the, to, to, uh, I'm saying that the best idea per se was right. to go dance. Right, I see that. You see, and the other interpretation doesn't include that. <laughs> so it's not the brevity is absolutely not a factor. Even though it's only two or three words, you have to distinguish between restrictive and non-restrictive and it changes the meaning you talk. I think I'm also uh, letting that comment to in, in the spoken form of this particular example. Well, if you spoke it, you would say it differently for the two meanings. Yeah. One would be, yeah. the best idea that Jack caught was to go dead. But if you wanted it the other way, you'd say, the best idea which Jack caught was to go dead. I say, well, you throw it away because that's not your essential thought. Yes. In speaking, wouldn't most people omit the word that? Would that be incorrect? Yes, most people would omit the word that, and then it definitely becomes restricted. The best idea, Jack. But it's is, not, not incorrect to leave out that. If it's it's not incorrect. It's a little more informal. It's more colloquial. All right, next. Who loves his master? Is that restricted? Restricted. Restricted. So you're saying that the meaning of this sentence is a certain type of dog is an ideal pet. The dog who loves his master, as opposed to the misanthropic dog who doesn't, and he's not. But what would it mean if you put commas around it and made it non-restricted? Which is possible if that's your intention, and much less possible. Yes. What do you mean what? No, if you put commas around it, the dog comma, who loves his master comma, then your main thought is what? The, dog's an ideal the dog pet. as such is an ideal pet. Any dog, all dogs, why? Because they love their master. So you'd be saying all dogs love their master and therefore are an ideal pet. Yes. Could you mean this dog no. he loves his master? The norm, and this is a special context. Dog, it always means generic. It doesn't mean that. Or this means the dog as such. Now, the last sentence there is actually an adaptation of, I believe it's actual wording of uh, Floyd Ferris. Dan Atlas, when he wrote that book, Why Do You Think You Think? <laughs> and the question is, the which are impossible? Now, I put this in because the examples up to here are quite simple and straightforward. But this is a torturous and tricky one, and sometimes I have had the experience, and I'm sure you have and will too, you cannot tell your own intention. 
you can't hold the difference between restrictive and non-restrictive because it's so subtle. And I put one of these in just to give you a taste that sometimes it gets so tricky. And in that case, my rule is this. If you can figure out a difference, follow the normal rules. If you can't leave the comma out on the principle of, it's out unless you can justify putting it in. Now, here is the case where it's tricky. Should there be a comma after contradiction or not? What is the difference in me? Now, this is the way it is in the novel. A study of space leads us to contradictions which are impossible, according to the human mind, but which exist nonetheless. Now, with the comma out, what is the mean? The mean, then, impossible is restrictive of contradictions. It's essential to grasp. In other words, it means the study of space leads us to impossible contradictions, which immediately implies what? Well, there are possible contradictions. Well, you don't want to imply that if you accept A as A. So you hesitate, shouldn't you put a comma there to indicate that you intend no, com no contradictions are possible. And therefore, when I put the comma, I'm saying all contradictions are impossible. Contradictions as such. On the other hand, there is the linguistic fact that for emphasis, we can say that's an impossible contradiction. You know, like laissez-faire capitalism, it's a redundancy, but it's there for emphasis. Now, you have to, as the writer, decide. And on top of that, you're expressing a view with which you disagree. Now, you have to, as the writer, decide. If I put the comma in, I lose that emphasis of impossible contradiction, but I keep my metaphysics clear that contradictions are impossible. If I do the reverse, I get the emphasis, but lose the metaphysics. Now, how essential is it? Will a reader pick it up? And you can sit there and puzzle. You see what I mean? Uh, as it turns out in the novel, he didn't care about right. the comp. Uh, it's right for Floyd Ferris. Yeah, that's right. right. He won. Except you could also argue it's right for Floyd Ferris, but the author wants to write in such a way that she doesn't concede anything while having him express his view. She wouldn't have, for instance, Floyd Ferris, she wouldn't present him as saying he knew that A was not A. She'd say he believed, etc., because knew implied that she agreed. And the question, therefore, is by omitting the comma, is she subscribing to the idea? You see the contradictions, uh, some contradictions are false. Now, this is this has almost become what you would call the rabbinical comma. <laughs> you have to debate the shadings to such an extent that it becomes not worth it. Although there are cases where it's difficult, but when you decide, it is decisive. But I put that in just to show you that it is not always clear cut. All right, now let's continue with this rule about restricting a non restrictive element. There are other modifiers, or other elements, I mean, other than relative clauses, to which the same principle applies. So it's simply the same rule that restrictive elements have no commas, and non-restrictive have commas. Only now we're applying to things other than relative clauses. The exact same rule, but it applies to all other kinds of elements are not merely relative clauses. And the rule is the same rule. If the element is restricted, no comma. If it's non-restricted, then it's a parenthesis, so it has to have comma. Now, for example, you might have an adverbial clause. Now, an adverbial clause is not a relative clause, right? Relative clauses are always adjectives. The book, which I saw, etc. We, we may have an adverbial clause. Look at, for instance, number 11, the first item. At the end of August, I decided to quit my job. Now, at the end of August, well, that happens to be a phrase, an adverbial phrase. I decided to quit my job as the main thing. The question is, do we have commas <coughs> around when fall was approaching or not? Now, when fall was approaching, that tells me something about the end of August, right? So it, it's a it's a, a, a modifier of this time 
situation at the end of August. It's an adverbial clause modifying this time period. Is it restrictive or non-restrictive? Does when fall was approaching restrict or non-restrict the preceding the end of August? Non-restrict. Non it's non-restrict. Consequently, you're separated by calm. In other words, your thought is this. At the end of August, I decided to quit my job. By the way, that's the same time the fall was approaching. Now, if it was restricted, what situation would you have to have? There are basically then two Augusts. There's the August when fall approaches and the August when it doesn't, which of course is climactically impossible. But if that were true, by omitting the commas, you would be saying, at the end of the August when fall is approaching, I quit my job, as opposed to the other August. Well, since there's only one, this doesn't restrict it. We've already got the subject in by the time we get to August. And therefore, this is put in commas as a parenthetical element. You see, it's not a relative clause. So it's another type of element. But it still has exactly the same rule. Now look at the next one. Here we have a single participle, beaten. I felt my knee. Now is beaten restrictive or non-restrictive? Does it, it's an adjective, modify by, does it um, restrict I or not? No, it does not. It simply says, I fell to my knees, by the way I was beaten. This was the cause of my fall. If you had no comma and you made it restrictive, what would your meaning be? I don't know, it would have to be something like, the beaten eye fell to my knees, but the triumphant one remained on his feet. You see, but if there's only one eye, it doesn't restrict. The eye itself is enough to get the subject in. Therefore, it has to be set off by comma. Now, here's a case. A single word, which is non-restrictive, has to take a comma to indicate its non-essential flow. All right, let's look at the next. She loves my favorite composer, Rachmaninoff. Is Rachmaninoff restricted? Oh, excuse me, let's wait that, uh, that example for a moment. Because I want to introduce one more point as part of this rule. Everything we've said on this rule, commas, to set off one type but not another, applies equally to apositives. Now, of course, you all remember what an appositive is. An appositive is a substantive immediately following a substantive. <coughs> My son John. It can be any kind of substantive, a noun, a pronoun, a gerund, a noun clause, whatever it is. And the rule is very simple. If the appositive is restrictive, then no commas are up. If it is not restrictive, it must take commas. So it's the same rule, only it applies now to appositive. Now the best explanation I ever found of this particular point, believe it or not, is in a modern grammar which is very rarely of a good explanation, but at this point has a good explanation. This is the Harbraith College Handbook. I don't know which edition, but it's, it, this point is good, and I'm just going to read it. Note that most appositives may be readily expanded into non-restrictive clauses. And then they give examples. Jesse, the caretaker, is a good fellow commas around the caretaker. That's the appositive, right? Coming after Jesse. And they explain, the appositive caretaker is equivalent to the non-restrictive clause who is the caretaker, right? It's just a short, instead of saying who is, you just say the caretaker, right? You make it simply the noun instead of the whole clause. But the idea is, is still, Jesse is a good fellow. And by the way, he's the caretaker. Right. So it is a non-restrictive, 
as opposed to what type of situation? There are multiple Jesses. And you say Jesse the caretaker as opposed to Jesse somebody else. Now, Sandberg, the biographer of Lincoln, was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. Commas or not around the biographer of Lincoln? Yes. yes. Because the appositive is equivalent to the non-restrictive clause, who is the biographer of Lincoln? Right? So the thought is, Sandberg was awarded the prize. By the way, he is the son. So it's non-restrictive, a non-restrictive apostle. Now see if you get this one. My companions were James White, Esquire, ESQ, William Smith, MD, and Rufus L. Black, PhD. Now, do those titles have a comma or not? Before. Yes. Uh, they, they are a positives. Do they come? Yes. Um, no, those are restricted. No, they're not restricted. They're non restrictive and they're separated by commas by exactly the same reason. If my companion were James White, by the way, he's an Esquire, and William Smith, by the way, he's an MD, and uh, Rufus Black, who is a PhD? All of those are simply the titles, in other words, degrees, all of that are shorthand for non-restrictive relative clause. And therefore, by the same rule, they, they take commas. What about junior? Same for junior, unless it's in a context where uh, you want to distinguish him from senior. And then you say Jack White Jr. You see, where it becomes essential. Because otherwise, you'd be saying Jack White, who is by his nature a junior, and there's his father sitting around and he's not a junior. See, this is all a matter of the context. Now, let me give you this one and see what you would do. The cook, not the caretaker, will assist you. Now, not the caretaker has a special name. Imagine what you call not the caretaker. It's a negative apology. Right. A negative apology, if you can stand that crazy off. And in this case, is it restrictive or non -restrictive? Same thing. Non-restricted. So it's the cook, who is not the caretaker, but that's added on. So it's comment. Now, the book comment. The positives are typically non-restrictive or parenthetical. They merely add information about a person or thing already identified. Such a positives are set off by comment. But when an appositive is restrictive, commas are omitted. When a positive is restricted. Now, for instance, the poet Sandberg has written the biography. Now, there, the Sandberg is essential because your sentence is not the poet, but that doesn't give you a sentence. What poet? All poets or what? So your thought is Sandberg, the poet Sandberg. So Sandberg is an appositive essential to making your meaning clear. Therefore, it is restrictive, no comma. Now, what would you do with this? His son James is sick. Would you put James in commas or not? Now, son James are two nouns. So, if James is an apostle. How many sons? I don't know. That's the question. How many sons? If, it's, if he's got many sons and you want to say his son James, then James is restricted. It's essential to grasping your meaning, and consequently, no comp. But suppose you want to say, he's only got one son, and he's sick. Then your thought is simply, his son is sick. By the way, his son's name was James. His son, in that case, is enough to get your subject into existence, and James then becomes non-restricted. So your sentence amounts to, his son, who is called James, is sick. Yes. But that's not clear that you're not addressing some third person named James. And yeah. if, if, you ever, <laughs> if, if it was there, you'd have to reconstruct your grammar. If that possibility exists, you'd have to start all over. <laughs> now, what about this one? William the Conqueror invaded England. Does the Conqueror go with uh, commas or not? Yeah. No. No commas, because this is not William invaded England. Any old William. 
by, and by the way, he was a conqueror. It's one specific, William the Conqueror. It's just like the poet Sanders. Now, if you get this idea, yes, the conqueror is not an apostate. Yes, it is. So now, is that his full name? William that wouldn't make any difference. No, no, this is a title that has been, he wasn't William the Conqueror. Uh, the way somebody is is uh, Jim Jones. His father is you know, Bill the Con uh, Tom the Conqueror. This is a type I created. Now, let me go on to some of these examples for further examples of uh, positives. Under number 11. She loved my favorite composer, Rachmaninoff. Now there is composer Rachmaninoff, two nouns. Rachmaninoff is in the positive, restrictive or not? Not. Not, therefore a com. Otherwise, if you put no com in, it would imply my favorite composer Rachmaninoff is against my other favorite composer, but that would make hash of the same. Favorite means my top. So there has to be a com. The idea that socialism is good is ridiculous. What is the positive in this sense? They are positive in this sense. That socialism is good. That's a noun clause, right? So it's a substantive explaining what you mean by idea. Now, is that restrictive or non-restrictive? Restrictive. You're not saying the idea is ridiculous because the question is which idea? It's just like the poet Sandberg. You're saying a spe specific idea. The idea of socialism is good is so, and therefore this is restrictive, consequently no commas. Now this is the type of thing you refer to as a restrictive, a positive noun clause, which is a terrific thing if you can find it in life. And here is an example. <laughs> All right, now the last two items there simply show you that you must pay attention to me. There are two examples of such as, one restrictive and one not. Now which is which? Many evil people such as Hitler and Stalin were once in power. There I put commas around it. Why? Well, it's non-restrictive because you've already defined the nature of the people. In the right. Process. So my thought is many evil people were once in power. And then I say, by the way, Hitler and Stalin are examples. So it is non-restrictive separated by commas. But in the next, people such as Hitler and Stalin were evil. It is restrictive because if it weren't my thought would be people were evil as such or as I mean a special type now if you get this you're all set if you don't you're lost in regard to calm there will be some exercises on this all right let us finish off the easy rules now and leave this stuff but there are still several although much easier <laughs> number four Now, I don't have a rule for this, but a subject, and that is what's called a serial comma, S-E-R-I-A-L. When you have a number of items in a series, where do you use a comma? Like you have A, B, and C. And the example, look at number 12. He likes to speak French, German, and Italian. Now, there's no doubt that you need a comma after French, right? So that's self-evident because you have to keep your unit it separate. Otherwise, you would take it as French, German, whatever that is. And if we didn't have the and in there, we just said French, German, Italian, we'd have to have a comma after German, too, for the same reason. What does it mean, by the way, if you list simply a series, three or more, without any conjunction? He likes to speak French, German, Italian. What does that mean? It means there may be more. There may be more. These are some of the things he likes. I'm not committing myself to whether this is total. But when you put a conjunction like and or or, you're saying this exhausts the possibility. Now the question is, when the and is in, do you or do you not precede it by a comma? Do you say, he likes to speak French comma, German comma, and Italian, or French comma, German and Italian? Now, 
authorities are divided on this. I myself follow foul, and that is I do not put a comma before the serial N. And here I follow the general principle where it's not mandatory, omit it. And Fowler points out the early comma takes the place of the word and. Instead of saying French and German and Italian, you put the first comma in in place of and. But when you have the and already there, you've already separated the elements by the very conjunction, so why stick another separation in in the form of a comma? And, that, and I accept that reasoning completely, and therefore I omit the serial comma. That means the comma before the and or the or. In almost all cases, not just for single words, but for long series. For instance, we shower, put on clothes, and rush to get breakfast. I wouldn't put a comma after clothes. But I think it's perfectly clear. I don't think it's wrong, but on the rule of the needless comma omitted, I omit it. But there's one situation with the serial comma where you have to put it in, and that is where the sentence would be unclear without it. Look at the next under 12. Now, if you have no comma after cook, what could it be taken to? Water and everything which you remain at home, cook and nurse children. So children become the object of cook too. So in a case like that, you have to uh, put the serial comma in. <laughs> Now, while we're sitting under four, there is another type of theories where the question of commas comes in, comes up. In this case, it's not an issue of and, it's an issue of two or more adjectives before a noun. And the question is, do you separate those adjectives by a comma or not? For instance, a clean, quiet room, a beautiful young lady, etc. Now, in some cases, you put a comma between the two adjectives, and in some cases, you don't. So it's a different kind of series. See, it's a number of items. Uh, do, when do you and when don't you? And the answer is like this. When the adjectives are coordinate, they have to be separated by commas. When they're not, they can't. What do we mean by coordinate? Remember, we're talking about coordinate clauses. And this is not coordinate words, but it's still the same idea. Yes. Yeah. Equal force. Equal states. Equal weight. And this, in this context, we mean each of them modifies the same noun. For instance, take clean, quiet room. What we're communicating is it's a room which has two features. It's a clean room. And it's a quiet. Those two adjectives are just two aspects of it of equal weight, equal stint. So they are coordinate, and you put a comma between them. You say a clean, comma, quiet room. Now the test of coordinate is can you invert the order? Can you change the order? A clean, quiet room. You can say a quiet, clean room, no problem. Or the other test is, can you stick an and in to show that they're on equal footing? A clean and quiet room. Yes, no problem. So when you put the comma in, the comma tells you, in effect, separate uh, the units. Each of these are to be taken with the noun. But, there are cases where they do not have that state, where the whole thing is one unit of thought. And in that case, they're not coordinate, you don't put a comma in. Take a beautiful young lady. Or take this as a simpler example, a tall oak tree. That's the simplest example. A tall oak tree. Now here, although it's technically Two modifiers, tall and made of oak. How does oak tree actually function in our thinking? As one entity, right? So you're saying it is an oak tree that's tall. 
So the oak tree, although two words function as a single unit, and therefore tall and oak are not coordinate. And the test is you can't invert. You can't say an oak tall tree. And you can't even put an ant. A tall and oak tree. See? Here, oak tree is the focus and tall modifier, as opposed to each of the modifying the noun. Equal. And in that case, no comma. The omission of the comma tells you this is all one unit. Now I take the example I mentioned, a beautiful young lady versus a beautiful, expensive car. Now in which case would you put a comma after beautiful and in which would you? Yes, and I guess it's beautiful, comma, expensive. Beautiful, comma, expensive, because we have no context for expensive car being a separate unit. A beautiful young lady, young lady is so common that it's become a single thought unit, and therefore it's not a beautiful and young lady, but a beautiful young lady. So a young lady becomes one entity in our mind. Uh, let me get ahead of it because we're running out of time and yes, maybe we'll have questions in the last lecture. I want to go to one last point with regard to commas. Use a comma where necessary to prevent misreading. Now, misreading, you know, is misinterpretation of the sentence because of breaking up into the wrong unit. In a way, all commas are for this purpose, to permit you to read the sentence accurately. But there are many cases that we have not covered before which nevertheless require a comma. They don't involve main clauses. They don't involve setting off parentheses or series, etc. But you would misread them without a comma. And consequently, the rule is where the comma would cure misreading, use it. Look at number 13. Now, how could that be misread? <laughs> before eating the girls. See, where girls are the object of eating, instead of before eating, comma, the girls, the subject of feel. Now, very often we have gerons or participles, etc., which can take an object. You, the grammar, you would read the noun following it as an object instead of a subject. And to cure that type of misreading, you put a comma after uh, eating. This is especially true with verbal. Or look at the next example. How could that be misread? After all the trouble. Yes. Is it a sentence modifier or is it... Uh, well, if it modifier? wasn't, you would misread it because you'd run out. If that's a prepositional phrase, after all the trouble, then what? We took his words, it doesn't make any sense. So you want to make it clear that it's after all. This modifies the whole sentence. That doesn't go with the trouble. It's not the object of after, you see. It's the subject of it. So that's to cure that misreading, you'd have to put a comma after all. Now, I don't mean to suggest that we have covered every possible use of the comma. There are many lesser ones. I don't want to multiply them needlessly, because I think the main things we cover. If you want one last type of situation, look at number 14. I'm not dignifying this by calling it 60, uh, point 0.6 because then I'd have to go to point 70. But if this is a smaller example, just to show you the lesser thing. Who can see where a comma would be required in 14? Yes. After most? After most. Why? Well, the sheet tells you. You have two constructions running into the same. Many of the children, most of the children. That's what we call a confluence. And to indicate, hold one, and here's another one, and they're both running into this point, you put a comma. So that's called the comma with confluence. But that's pretty obvious. But if not most, it's like a parenthetical element there, so it's not really a separate rule. And that's enough for me to strain your ability to take in. But that doesn't mean I'm finished for tonight. Because I want to just underscore what we've said by saying a, a, a word on the topic of needless commas. 
This is just what I've given you before in reverse. I've been telling you where commas are required. Now let's consolidate that by especially where commas are not required or even wrong. Comma has a nature. It is not always safe to put a comma in. And the best formulation I ever heard for this principle, when not to put a comma in, is given by Paul. And he says, never separate inseparables. Do not put a comma between grammatically connected elements, which are the essence of your structure. Because a comma means stop, separate, take apart from each other. And if these are essentially conjoined, you're simply confusing the reader. So, for instance, he regards this follower as basically wrong ever to put a comma between subject and verb. Now, a lot of people do that if they have a very long subject, because they're afraid your reader will not know to take the whole subject together unless they put a comma. Take this type of sentence. The sight of the prancing horses with their daring riders doing exciting tricks filled me with awe. Now, all up to tricks is the subject. And a lot of them don't have to stop and say, put it all together to make a subject. But there still is a comma between subject and verb, which is bad stylistic. So although many writers do it, uh, Fowler thinks, and I think this is a valid point, that you, that should be an exception. These long, long subjects, rather than being used and separated by a comma, shouldn't be used. If they're that long, reconstruct the grammar so you can keep the essential subject. Or, for instance, it is wrong to separate a verb and an object with a comma. Look at number 15. The book says that the ship sank without a trace. Now that is wrong because it's a simple object, noun clause, that the ship sank without a trace is what the book said. No grounds to separate with the comma. Four, Professor X, I didn't write this, seemed weaker than he did a year ago. He could not have a comma after weaker. Why not? Because the essential element there is weaker than. That's the very nature of the sentence in the comparison. Consequently, if you put a comma, seemed weaker than he did, you simply break up an essential connection. This applies generally to compounds. The players work together and gain a victory. You would not put a comma between work together and gain. That's not two clauses. Why is it? One such, right? So it's just a compound verb. You would never separate compounds in the typical case in that case, because they're both part of the essential action. Well, that's as much as I can squeeze in with regard to commas. Now, comma, of course, is only one mark. It's the trickiest and the subtlest, but it's only one. If we had several other sessions, we could go on to all the others, although I did say something about the semicolon and something about the dash and parentheses. I said something about the period and the opening. I said something about the colon. The only thing in conclusion I want to say is something about the question mark in one typical situation where it's misused. Most of these that you have to get from a book. But they're pretty straightforward. If you understand commas, the rest is really simple. But look simply at number 16 to get one last error. This time about, punctuate, about the question. What's wrong with number 16? Well, the, the comment there in parentheses tells you what's wrong. Okay. Uh, well, basically, it is a statement, it is not a question, and the part that sounds like a question is the statement of what he said. Right. Do you know the difference between indirect and direct discourse? Direct, you actually quote a person. Your friend comes up to you and you say, my friend asked, comma, quote, do you know the truth, question mark, close quote, and 
Shiva, is it important for me to learn it? You actually quote what he said. Indirect, you're going to take his comment and put it within your grasp. My friend asked whether you should know the truth or whether I knew the truth, etc. You're taking the same content, but you're not quoting it directly. You're building it into your grasp. In indirect discourse, you do not put questions after a question. Because the essence of the grammar is my friend asked. And the rest is just simply what he asked. So it's a declaration. Now in this case, the trouble is a switch from indirect to direct, which is never allowed. Why? On what grounds is it not allowed? See, it's indirect, whether I knew the truth. And then the next is direct. Should I, is it important? How should it be said in order to be indirect in both? My friend asked whether I knew the truth, and if so, whether it would be important for him to learn it also. That will make both of them indirect, and that's required by what principle? Uh, Parallelism, right. And therefore, this sentence, uh, the reason for putting a question mark there is an inadvertent switch to direct discourse from indirect, and therefore the feeling is direct, you have to put a question mark. But the error is, if it's indirect, it has to be indirect consistently, and if so, a period, no question. Now that's a sort of a minor footnote, but I just put it in because it's a point that's often got wrong. Now I gave you a lot of theory tonight, because you have to know there is no remaining lecture of the two, <laughs> which is remotely this long. So you've got through the longest by far. The homework here is listed. There is 13 examples. Add or subtract commas as required. But we have a few minutes to restart on the homework from last time. Can I ask one question? Yes. Uh, is it ever correct to use semicolons instead of commas in a series? Yes. You want to use what page? You can use semicolons instead of commas in a series. The main justifiable use would be when your series itself is punctuated internally by commas. And that therefore a whole bunch of commas, you wouldn't know where the basic elements came in. So you suppose it was. He likes French, which he learned in uh, Paris. German, which he learned in Berlin. And you want commas now, because each of those is non-restrictive. And if you simply put them like that, you wouldn't know where your series element ends. So you will say, he likes French, comma, which he learned in Paris, semi. German, comma, which he learned in Berlin, semi, and so on. So then your semi separating the items in the series, and comma is punctuating within each item. That's the main use for sending and replacing comms. There are others like for emphasis, but that's the main structure. Yes? Where does the dot, dot, dot structure? Well, that's your entertainment. You're completing that. An ellipsis of three dots is basically for omitting material in a quote. Uh, that's uh, not a punctuation mark. Please. I wasn't thinking of it that way. Where oh. I see it is stylistically where people... You mean for purposes of pause? No, that's at, at best permissible in fiction. You can't use three dots in nonfiction for purposes of slowing it down. That is strictly a device of dialogue in fiction to indicate the guy stopped talking and didn't know what to, to do. But so that does not indicate a pause in nonfiction. Now, I would like to do just a bit of our homework so we can have the feeling of some sense of progress here. <laughs> We did already number one and four. The instruction, this is a homework for number five. Let us look at number two. Correct any errors in the use of verbal or pronoun. All right, what is wrong with number two? Yes, in the back row. Yes. Uh, the which, uh, you don't know where it refers to. The which is ambiguous. Well, give me the two possibilities that it could refer to. Well, it could be hobby. 
It could be simply a relative pronoun directly referring to a hobby. My hobby is the cause of all my trouble. Or it could be what? Help me afford my hobby. In which case, if it was the fact that you can't afford my hobby, and that fact is the source of all my trouble, what type of reference do we call it? Broad. Broad reference. And this is the type of case where you can't tell if it's a narrow pronoun, a relative pronoun, right for the preceding noun, or for the whole clause of broad reference. And so it's an ambiguous pronoun for that reason. How would you reconstruct it? Suppose you decided that it's the broad reference you want to make clear that you want to state. The fact that you can't afford the hobby. How would you rewrite this to make that fit? Yes. The financial demands of my hobby are the cause of all my trouble. You, you really changed the word. The financial demands of my hobby are the cause of all my trouble. That's unequivocal. But suppose we weren't that ingenious. And we want to keep basically the same words, but we want to make it simply unambiguous. Yes. Not affording my hobby is the cause of all my trouble. All right. You made it a negative gerund. Not affording my hobby. That's not too perfect because it's not clear who is not affording, but okay. But there is a simple, there's a simpler way still, yes. I cannot afford my hobby, money being the cause of all my trouble. Money being the cause of all my trouble? No, that's not fair. Because it's my lack of money that's the cause of all my trouble. So that would be misleading. There's a much simpler way. Instead of which, just put another type of pronoun or stand-in, which makes it clear that you mean I can't afford my hobby, rather than just hobby. And what is the obvious, simple phrase to stand, uh, to stand for that? Yes. Is that? Is that? Well, the cause of all my troubles is that I cannot afford it. Well, you put the cause of all my trouble is? My hobby. So you, you did what you have done many times. You changed the order of the main clause. But I want it kept this way. Yes. The fact that I cannot afford yeah. my hobby. The fact that I cannot afford my hobby is the cause of all my trouble. That's why people put those, the fact that, in. Because that signals you, I'm talking about the whole thing, <coughs> and not just the entity hobby. Or you could just as well have said, I cannot afford my hobby. Semicolon. This fact is the cause of all my trouble. By making it this fact, you see, that right away gives you the whole reference rather than just the word hobby. Yes. Oh, uh, can't you just say that I cannot afford you my hobby? You can just say that I cannot afford my hobby is the cause. Right. Because then you're using a noun clause. Right. It's fun. Okay, number three. What's wrong with number three? Somebody from this division? Is anybody alive and functioning over here? <laughs> I don't get any hands raised in this whole section here. I can't get any takers even with that intimidating remark. No, then they're over. Yes. Well, the, uh, the switch in case from... Uh, the case of something is wrong. What? Is whoever for whomever and whomever... Well, which is which? Take one at a time. Uh, I shall follow whoever should be whomever. It should be whomever. Why? Is it the object of whomever of follow? Yes, it is. No, no I, I take it back. It's I'll choose. What is it? What is whoever whomever the object of this? Choose. They choose whomever. What then is the actual object of follow? Shall follow. The whole clause. The whole clause, whomever they choose. And the rule is here: the case is determined by. It's used in its own clause, and in its own clause, whoever is the object of choose, so it has to be objective case. Who was that? You say it should be, I shall follow whomever? Whomever they choose. And it's the object of choose. Oh. It's not the object of whomever, of follow. Follow takes whomever they choose. Now, what about the next one, David? Or whomever should be whoever. And this time it should be whoever what? It's the subject of it's it is. It's the subject of it is. And a pronoun's case is determined by its use in its own clause. So it still is, I shall follow whoever is in charge. But the object of the follow is the whole clause. We did four, so we're speeding along here to number five. 
And on top of the empire is tape filming happiness was easy to feel. Now this is an era we didn't actually discuss, but it's very similar to an era we discussed. And consequently, I uh, felt free to see if what you could do with it. Simple. Can I hear you? No subject in well, the subject of the main cause is happiness. Doesn't seem right, though. Well, that's true, but why not? Be a person. Well, in other words, you're saying happiness is the implied subject of on top of the Empire State Building, because no other subject is mentioned, but how can happiness be the subject? So what is the actual construction when on top of the Empire State Building? When introduces a cause, right? Mm -hmm. Only that happens to be, in this case, a clause in which the subject and verb is implied but omitted. What is the name, do you think, of a clause which omits some of its central elements? A clause which omits, a clause which glides over. Let's call that the elliptical clause. And in this case, because we we made it elliptical, we don't know what is really the subject. It makes it sound like happiness is the subject. It sounds as though, because happiness, when happiness is on top of the building, it's easy to feel. Now, that means because this clause is so worded, in this particular case, we don't know what to attach it to. So it, what does it do? It just hangs there, and we don't know what it goes with. And that means it dangles. dangles. This is a dangling elliptical cause. And the only cure for it is make it non-elliptical. When I was on top of the Empire State Building, it was easy for me to feel happy. Number six. You knew it to be I, and I knew it was him. Okay. All right. I'm trying to get different. I yes. Yeah. Uh, the case is spherical subjective. In the use yeah, of that's correct. Uh, What's uh, wrong with I there? I should be me. It's spherical subjective. Why should I be me? Why should? Explain. What case is it? What case is it? It would be the. You can't tell from the form because in English it has the same form as subject or object. But in this case, what is it? Subjective or object? It's the object. It's the objective case. Why is it the objective case? What rule does it have in the sense? What what type of construction is to be? The infinitive. What case does the subject of an infinitive have? The objective case, right? So it is the subject of to be. The subject of an infinitive is always in the objective case. If you look up your notes, we actually covered that last time. Now, if it is in the objective case, what rule comes up? The verb to be takes the same case on both sides. So if it has the objective on one side, it has to have on the other. So the I is wrong. What about what else is wrong in this sentence? I knew it was him. Yes. Uh, it, uh well, using what it means, you have to have it and what comes after it be the same case. But what case is it? What is he? What case is it? Here. What case is it? Objective. No. If it was objective, then him would be right. Why is it subjective? It's because what conjunction is implied? That. So your sentence is, I knew that it was, and it is the subject of was. 
the width subjective. And if it's subjective, then the bird to be has to take the same case on both sides, and therefore it has to be V, not here. So this sentence should read, you knew it to be me, and I knew it was he. Number seven. I left your hitchhike to Denver and looked terrible. <laughs> Very typical way of people writing. Very poor. This is much worse than getting the case wrong. Because this is an essential emptiness of thought. What is the simple word in this construction? Yes. Broad reference? It. Oh, it. Now you say it has a broad reference. Well, you could say that. It's hard to know what the reference of it is here. There are at least three possible meanings. If you don't stretch your imagination and just read the sentence narrowly, what are three <laughs> possible reference for it? Uh, that I left her. The fact of leaving her was terrible. The hitchhiking. The hitchhiking. And most likely death. Or Denver. Or Denver. Because of my average against Denver. The actual noun, the city itself. So here it's completely empty pronoun. Is a broad reference, middle reference, or no reference? Or, or the immediate reference? Number eight. Number eight. What's wrong with number eight? Dictatorship is said to cause more evil in history than war did. Now that should strike your ears wrong, if not your grammatical categories. And then if you think there'll be a rule. Yes, sir? I have a change, but I forgot the reason. There's a problem with intensity and infinitive. Correct. Infinitive tense is wrong. Two cause should be? To have cause. This is the case where we require the perfect infinitive, not the present. Why? This is the one case where the perfect infinitive is mandatory. And what is the situation? What is the tense of the main verb? Present. What is the tense? Is fixed. It's passive voice, but present tense. What is the what is the reference, the time reference of the infinitive? We're talking about the whole past. So it refers to a time prior to the main verb. And that's the one time that you use the perfect infinitive. If it's the same as the main verb or future, it's a present infinitive. But when the infinitive refers to an earlier time, dictatorship is said now to have caused across all the past, then it has to be the perfect infinitive. And I want to do one more. Is the did correct? Well, you or? want to kill my time. What? <laughs> the did, yeah, the did, the did. You mean because? It, it, it looks like an emphatic that in fact should be in it's itself. Like, almost like did it present. You mean it should be present? Do? No, dictation has caused more evil in history than war itself. Well, then war does. Well, then war does. Well, then war does. War has. Yeah. No, because you're making here, as I understand it, since I made it up, you're making a speech about all past. You're saying, throughout a whole past, dictatorship caused more evil than war did. Than war caused. Now, I don't see anything wrong with the did, per se, unless you're saying did would imply the word cause when we change it to to have caused. So you don't have the word cause. In which case, I would just drop the did off and say then war, period. Yes. I don't, you really want me, therefore, to say we have to stop on this item. All right. Yeah. I don't understand. Dicta if you say dictatorship is said to cause more evil in history than war does, what's the matter with Because history is past. You could only do it if you were saying something like dictatorship is said to cause more evil for man than war does. Then you're making it present. But once you're taking the sweep of what is done throughout history, that's a past tense. But refer to from the presence of the present verb, you see. 
And that's exactly the situation for a perfect infinity. All right, we got 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, plus the hallmark on commons. So we have our work cut out for next time.